Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar presentation, How to Select Case Studies for Healthcare Quality Management, presented by Springer Publishing Company and featuring the authors of the new textbook, Healthcare Quality Management, a Case Study Approach, published in 2020. My name is David Diodana, and I am the senior editor responsible for the health administration and public health publishing programs here at Springer Publishing. For those who do not know much about Springer Publishing Company, we are an independent publisher known for innovative textbooks, professional references, and clinical products in the fields of nursing, behavioral and health sciences, and medicine. Before I hand the webinar over to the presentation team, please note that this webinar will be recorded, disseminated, and posted on our website in case you miss any part of the presentation. And we will also be taking a few questions at the end of the presentation and posted um, from the audience and through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Please feel free to send along any questions as we go during the presentation itself. We also welcome feedback for how we did at the conclusion of this webinar. So please fill out the brief survey at the end of the webinar if you have time and would like to. And now I am delighted to hand over the presentation to Dr. Zach Pruitt, Dr. Candace Smith, and Mr. Eddie Perez Ruberte, who are co-authors of the textbook Healthcare Quality Management, a case-based approach. Zach, over to you. Well, thank you very much, David, and welcome to everyone to the webinar on how to select case studies for healthcare quality management. Um, as David said, I'm Dr. Zach Pruitt. I'm a assistant professor in the College of Public Health at University of South Florida. My colleague, Candace Smith, is always with us. Dr. Smith is the Vice President of Operations and the Chief Nurse Executive for Lee Health at Cape Coral Hospital. Thank you, Zach. And I am Eddie perez Ruberte. I am a uh, Lean Project Manager at Baker Health Systems, and I'm also a certified Lean Expert on Six Sigma Black Belt from ASQ. So I'm very proud of our team to put together this book for you. And you're joining us today based on the webinar objectives that we posted in our advertisements. Effectively though, we're trying to explain what we think the best ways to select case studies for healthcare quality management. And in doing so, we wanna answer the questions, how can I find case studies that build targeted competencies, encourage hands-on problem solving, reinforce the fundamentals and are fun and engaging for students. So let's start. Where do you find your case studies? A quick poll, if you could. Where do you find, where do you most often find case studies for your healthcare quality management courses? Maybe through Harvard Business Review, academic journals, another textbook, maybe you write them yourself or you don't have cases yet. Okay, good. Yeah, these are great sources, all of you saying another textbook and academic journals. Other textbooks do have them. They might be a little different from how we presented. Academic journals, of course, are a good way for those, those uh, case studies. Uh, we've published cases in, in academic journals before, so that's a good way to get, get to them. Well, good. And some of you write them to yourself. Um, yeah, so that's, that's sometimes a heavy lift, and, but you get what you really want, and I understand you might want to do that. So we'll explain some ways to find um, cases that match what you're trying to um, accomplish in your courses. So we think there are many different ways to identify cases. One way to do it is identify the common challenges in healthcare quality management. Or maybe you wanna start with, okay, what professional competency am I trying to teach? Or you wanna have cases that address the interprofessional team or have some sort of data analysis proficiency requirement. So have data so that they have to learn how to solve it using data analysis. Quality management tool or approach. You may wanna share something specific about lean or Six Sigma, fishbone diagrams and control charts and the like. Or you might start with, oh, I want students to know about a particular healthcare sitting, setting from the hospital outpatient examples. So we'll share it ideas and go deeper on each of these ways to identify cases in the webinar. So I, I'm wondering, what's the most important factor that you use when seeking the ideal case study? So competencies, tool or approach, explore the necessary topics such as patient safety, 
match the relevant healthcare setting, or you're really seeking the engaging narrative that helps with discussion groups. I like that last one. Nothing like a good discussion. Okay, good. Addresses competencies applicable to the relevant tool or approach. Okay, that's great to see. 38% of you. Um, explores necessary and important topic, matches relevant healthcare setting, and loving a good discussion. Okay, well, that's good. A little um, good variety of, of components. Well, let's start with common challenges in healthcare quality. I think as we in the United States become more familiar with the common healthcare quality challenges, we can begin to start categorizing them under, um, under groups. And what we've done is provided cases in our book around process improvement, patient experience, patient safety, and sort of a catch-all for performance improvement that addresses all types of issues related to quality improvement that responds to the external environment, sort of pay for performance issues and the like to improve all types of quality projects. Now, of course, professional competencies drive a lot of what we do in higher education from the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education or some of the nurse leadership groups, uh, NCHL, which is a National Center for Healthcare Leadership or NAHQ, all providing us with competencies to uh, lead our students to develop as they go through our programs. So having a start of what we want them to know in terms of skills is a great way to design your programs. And in such, they have requirements that we have to meet. And so we choose competencies based on those to develop through our case study work, of course. The case studies that we provide in healthcare quality management address, of course, the obvious process and quality improvement. But we also seek to have it be covered more complex, higher level uh, competencies such as collaboration, initiative seeking, information seeking, change leadership and communication skills. Of course, the broad base of, of competencies and skills that students need to learn to be able to run quality improvement projects is quite broad. And so these cases, especially through the discussion groups, uh, discussion questions that you can uh, lead with your class addresses these harder to assess competencies. To make it easy for instructors or leaders to choose the right case competent case, we have a case to competency crosswalk. Chapter five goes into great detail on the competencies of various professions. And as you can see here on this screen, we have a health administration competency crosswalk that is listing all the competencies that, that a program might need to address uh, on the left, such as community collaboration or organizational awareness or accountability and matching them to the cases that we think addresses those competencies, such as case 18, a mom's story of sepsis. So there are lots of competencies listed in table 5.1 with the cases matched up for it, just to make it easier for instructors to find the cases that address those competencies. And so now we'll ask Candace to address interprofessional teamwork. Thank you, Dr. Pruitt. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that you segued in nicely by sharing uh, the 25 competencies that are available, but more importantly, each one of them uh, within the cases truly addresses that interprofessional teamwork. Um, our three, the three of us, when we were preparing uh, much of the work in the book, our biggest focus was around interprofessional teamwork. And we can't underscore the significance of that when teaching healthcare quality management. So the 12 cases that we selected around interprofessional team, um, as you can see, you know, these cases, when you look at you know, return to work and a home health care agency. It's not just focusing on one aspect of that, but it's really looking at how does your human resource department, how does your technology staff, as well as your physician and clinical manager really work together to look at those problems? Again, it can't be something that just one discipline identifies and corrects, but it's really that bringing people together using the tools to arrive at the right solution. Uh, and certainly when you look at even around the ophthalmologist who could not see, you'll see that many of our cases uh, provide some humor and as well as they really address 
bringing people together to solve uh, current you know, problems within their, their uh, relative area of expertise. Um, the last one really around patient experience in home care was a very interesting one because it really allowed us to look at not only from nursing, but bringing our physical therapy, our quality improvement department, but other people really in to look at what are the uh, associated influences with patient experience um, throughout the home care agency work. So we appreciate the, you know, the, the 25 cases, but most importantly, I think using that interprofessional team is really important. And that's what will really drive developing your problem statement. There's a variety of topics for interprofessional team, um, really within these cases. If you look at pharmacy and nursing and our physicians, how could you work with that? Looking at code blue, and really understanding who are all the people that are involved in code blue and how do we make sure that we don't have a failure to rescue and what are the safety elements of that when you look at even like the warehouse that that picture that stands out you know in terms of there's all sorts of people that influence uh, decision making and certainly outcomes and also identification of problems within the healthcare focus um sepsis as zach just mentioned definitely an area that it doesn't involve one discipline um, I've been in healthcare over 40 years and, and having the experience of working interprofessionally with teams has really made a significant difference. The different settings, the next slide please, that you are gonna see within the cases truly are focused around the outpatient arena, um, the hospital, the inpatient, the acute rehab, of course, home healthcare, our insurance companies, um, you name it, anywhere that healthcare influences or you know, interconnects with different um, areas within a community, we've identified definitely cases that can support that. The, the actual case type, when you look at matching the healthcare setting to the case type, uh, we had to really look at that, you know, from a process improvement. Uh, when you look at the summer internship journal, you know, we really wanted to infuse students into our cases and how they experience healthcare and how they learn from working in a, a team. So that was really important to match that healthcare setting to the case type. When you look at claims payment and processing, as we talked about, focusing around that managed care component to the healthcare industry. And then lastly, of course, the ambulatory surgery center. So again, we really took a lot of time to match that healthcare setting to the case type. I, have, I am an associate professor in the uh, State College of Florida and I teach healthcare quality management using an entire case study approach. And it has really changed the way students are now looking at healthcare from multitude of lenses. So we appreciate that you'll take the chance to look at these healthcare settings to case types. Thank you. Thank you, Candace, that's great. Another way in which we thought to help instructors is there is this foundational skill to quality management that is analytical thinking. I mean, when you look at the methodologies that we're highlighting in the book, starting with lean, you have the, the PDSA approach. We really want to instill in people that structure problem solving mindset where you take the time to really plan and consider how you're going to measure your improvements and then implementing those improvements and, and studying that that's the big piece here, studying what you get out of those improvements and then reacting to those improvements. The same thing with Six Sigma. Six Sigma is another methodology that we're highlighting and, and, and really helping you teach throughout the book. And the Six Sigma methodology teaches us the demake cycle. And again, in the demake cycle, another very structured problem solving approach where we start with defining the problem, really taking the time to measure and again, analyze. So analysis is a huge important piece of quality improvement. And so what did we do? We created different levels of data analysis that you can teach. And we actually gave you a cheat sheet here, as I like to call it in Appendix B, that shows the cases that have data accompanying data files with them along with not only what the case is but the description of the di the type of data that you're going to find so for example in the first case a summer internship journal the data file contains 344 lines of timestamp data now that's a very 
you could call that a very basic case. But if you want to get really into more, there is this case of emergency department heroes that has 8,500 lines of emergency de department patient encounters. So we, what we did is we went all the way from, we, we are presenting you varying levels of complexity of in the data analysis, anything from just a couple of lines of HCAPS measures data all the way to what I mentioned, the 8,500 lines, 5,000 lines of patient level time stamp data. So depending on the kind of or the amount of complexity that you want to help your students develop or get comfortable with, there is a case in the, in the book for you. And when we created these cases, we're giving you two files as instructors. We're giving you the raw data file, which is the student file, only contains the raw data, only raw data. Now the instructor file, which is kind of like contains the solution and it actually shows some of the tools and analysis tools that could be used. For example, pivot tables, we, it may have Pareto charts. It may have some more advanced Six Sigma analysis tools like ANOVA, analysis of variation. It has different kinds of tables and different charts that can be used so that you have an idea of what kind of data analysis tools can be added or can be expected from the students to, to develop through these cases. Now, finally, talking about solutions, we are providing you two A3, completed A3s that provide you two different approaches to solutions for each of these cases. The A3 is the fundamental core tool that ties all these cases together, every case is to be developed in an A3. And when students are going through the problem solving methodology, the A3 really helps them go through that. And here, the case includes two potential solutions. This doesn't mean that these are the only solutions because with quality management, we, we can get there in very, very different ways. But this also gives you some ideas of how those tools, those analysis can really come into the problem solving methodology. So you also get two completed A3s, two different approaches to each case. And if you are interested in teaching some specific quality management tools and approaches, we also have a cheat sheet for you on that. And that is called Appendix D. So for example, let's say you are wanting to highlight process mapping and you want your students to learn and really become proficient at process mapping. Boom. Appendix D tells me that if I go to case two, I'm going to be able to teach that and get a little bit more in depth on that. And the way the book does that is it gives you for each case, it gives you a particular tool or approach. It gives you a little bit of a summary, a more in-depth look at that tool or approach and the A3s and the solutions presented use that tool or approach so that students can see how it can be used so that you as instructors can also see how it can be used and how it can come together. So for example, other than the ones that were in that list, if you want to do a fishbone like Zach mentioned at the beginning, if you want people to really become proficient at using fishbone and diagrams in healthcare to do the problem solving in healthcare, there's a case for that. You go and find that case in Appendix D and you'll be able to do that. Swim lane diagrams are a very particular, very specific type of process map that when Candace was talking about the interprofessional team, a lot of our issues, a lot of our teams are interprofessional teams. So a swim lane diagram is a great tool to help teach people to really understand all the collaboration that's happening in every one of these progress in process improvement teams. So you have a, a case for that. And finally, control charts. Control charts are a very important tool to help people really understand trends and really not react to things that are really part of their normal variation. So we also have a case that highlights that. So like I said, there's 25 cases and each case helps you teach a particular tool. All you have to do is decide the tool you want to teach and go to Appendix D and you will be able to get that. Great, thanks Eddie. So the three of us worked really hard to develop the cases that covered how instructors might choose case studies. 
Of course, the book is like many textbooks, provides the history and introduction and some of the key foundational elements in the beginning of the textbook. And then 25 cases come after that, providing you also with helpful matrices that you can find the case that matches what your approach to teaching, whether it's competency-based, whether it's tool-based, whether it's settings, interprofessional team, and the like. So we really appreciate you joining us for today's webinar. And with that, we'd, we'd love to stick around and answer any questions you might have about how to choose cases or healthcare quality management in general. Thanks so much, Zach, Candace, and Eddie. Um, so we'll now be taking more questions. I have some here um, that I'll get to with the authors, um, but please also feel free to send more questions to the Q&A um, feature on Zoom. Um, the first question I have for the team is, um, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, but can you describe, I guess, the format of the cases and in the textbook and how detailed they really get into the content? I'll take the first shot at that, and then I'll let my colleagues and co-authors join in after and things I, they may want to highlight. So, well, the cases are very in-depth. I think many times that you can have really things that I would call vignettes with textbooks, and those are fine. They give context to students and allow a jumping off point. But for students to do applied, active learning, they need really in-depth case studies, the ones that are realistic and engaging, providing data and conflict and misunderstanding and misdirection. And so things that help students really hone their critical thinking and problem solving skills. So each case comes with objectives, introductions, uh, the full case, which is typically surrounded by a narrative of some sort that provided within the context of healthcare and real characters within healthcare. And then of course, discussion questions, which often cover those hard to get at competencies like interpersonal skills. Yes, and I will add to that, they are very realistic. Um, the, the dialogue that happens is really an, an opportunity for the students to really see themselves in that situation and how do you extract information from the dialogue that is happening? That's also a piece that we've carefully added to, to the cases. And sometimes the cases evolve over a period of months and, and these conversations and these interactions are happening through these cases. So you can see how the, the different characters are reacting to, like, like Zach mentioned, conflict and, and some of these proficiency that we're trying to develop uh, of communication and the interprofessional team, all those things, how are those things playing out? And some of the discussion questions really hone into what are some of the, the things happening in the team at any point in time. So I would call them, they are really in depth and they have much more than just the technical aspects of it. They have a lot of the emotional and social aspects of, of what we currently encounter in quality improvement in healthcare. Yeah, I would just add that the writing with the case studies, it's a conversational writing. And so as you know, Zach and Eddie shared, these are characters that you can find yourself uh, learning from and positioning yourself in their seats as you're reading. So it becomes, they're very engaging, um, but they really are in that conversational writing uh, from a work, perspective, work product perspective in that format. I'm real lucky to have co-authors that work in the healthcare settings and actually apply this work. As a professor, it's nice to have uh, the boots on the ground from the people doing the work to be able to translate the theory into actual practice. So what else do we have, David? Yes, uh, the next question was, um, wondering where in the book you can find long-term care cases or content. Definitely long-term care. So we have a, a appendix that can show you the, the setting and match which cases they're there. So we have a medication error, um, a patient, I'm sorry, a patient misidentification. We have um, human resources related in long-term care or in uh, non-acute, sub post-acute care. So there are a variety of in those settings for sure. Great. Um, I have a question about competencies, which you got to at the beginning, um, showing the um, table and the crosswalk. Can you explain a little further how you address the competencies um, in the cases and, and with the content more generally? Yeah, so as a professor, I'm, I'm acutely aware of how important competency-based education 
uh, can be for uh, healthcare programs, higher education programs of all types. So we took a special care to look at the various professions from health administration, medicine, nursing, uh, social work, and, and more to try to make sure that we covered those competencies. And so we have a crosswalk or a matrix for those as well uh, within uh, chapter five that goes into depth into those professions and the competencies, how they match up. We realize that management and quality improvement in general requires many what we call soft skills, right? right? And so soft skills include those interpersonal, emotional intelligence, leadership issues, and we wanted to instill those in the case studies. And so each of the discussion, not only the objectives at the beginning of each case, but also the discussion questions really get at those, those issues. Um, because they're all set around conflict and mistakes and challenges with people and quality improvement in general, students will get an inside look uh, as to how to solve those and be able to think critically about what they would do in those instances. So yeah, competency-based education, especially when you're thinking about an accreditor coming in, they want to know how you are addressing it with content and with assessment. And we, we think this, this textbook does a good job of helping you address those, those needs. Great. Um, and you got to this in some of the answers. Um, so we provide discussion questions. And can you talk a little bit about them and the other instructor resources that really help align with the cases? Well, I'm going to defer to Candace, Dr. Smith on this one. Uh, she was a stickler on those discussion questions and, such, and she's such a good teacher that um, I'll, I'll defer to her. Yeah, I, I thank you for that, uh, Zach, but I do appreciate the need to have good discussion questions and each case truly identifies, um, like Eddie had shared, these are characters and these are characters that, again, their names are changed to protect the innocent, if you will. And what's great about them is that the discussion questions allows you to get into the mindset, to understand what that mindset is of each character. So the discussion questions associated with the PowerPoint um, are very important. Those are, that's a big part of what you'd want the students to be doing, as well as, you know, you'd want the students to be working together and building an A3, understanding when they read a case, how are we going to define the problem? What is that problem going to look like? And so using uh, the work that's in the textbook that drives them to a solid problem statement they can then begin to use those case studies along with the book to really build a good A3, as well as learn from a different lens, each of the characters' perspective. I hope that answers the question. I think so. The, I think I wanna add a little bit before maybe refer, uh, deferring to Eddie to talk about the A3, but regarding instructor resources. So not only answers to all the discussion questions to provide it, you know, I'm a professor. This is hard. Finding cases and matching them to your to your courses is not easy. So we took a lot of effort to develop the instructor resources, uh, such as the manual and solution sets and the like. So we wanted to make it really easy for you to um, to match the cases to what you need to address, and also to provide you with the answers, not only the data, but Eddie, if you could speak to the A3s specifically. Yes, thank you, Zach. I um, we we teach the A3. We take the time to teach the A3 in uh, some of the earlier chapters, and then each case, the way we are encouraging instructors to solve that is to give those students the, the, those A3s and go through that. And each case goes through two solutions of of what that problem solving uh, journey could look like, if you will, and we've really taken the time and some of those solutions were developed by us and some of those solutions were developed by by a real student going through some of the cases as as they really um took on the the quality improvement journey so those are very comprehensive again not the only solution potential solutions for for the cases but they are um very well thought out as i would probably do it if I was the, and I, you know, I, I do this stuff every day with, with our teams. And so they are the A3s in a, in a, in a way that we really see the, those coming together. And if these students really develop these, these 
skills early on. I can't wait to have them in, in, in healthcare administration. Also, there are other resources. We've, we've provided a PowerPoint for the, each case that addresses those uh, discussion questions and maybe some ways in which we can imagine those discussion questions being answered. So like Zach said, we put a lot of, of work into um, those, those um, instructor resources. Thank you. Um, Zach, do you want to mention the podcast or maybe Candace as well? We love the podcast. So each case, we've not only, sometimes the case was inspired by one of uh, people we know in the industry. And so we would then reach out to that person to discuss the case in a short podcast, about 10 minutes long. So we'd discuss their career and the case and their response. And oftentimes it was, you know, a little bit more context on how things go down. Uh, you know, uh, Eddie had a great relationship with a healthcare architect and designer, engineer that did Lean Six Sigma within designing. And so we have an IR suite case that she inspired and, and there was a podcast about it. Uh, uh, Candace and opioid epidemic and community-based care. Um, Candace knew, knows about uh, discharge planning and we had nurses and social workers join us for the podcast. So super fun, great way to provide context to students of all levels on how quality improvement really goes. Thanks, Zach. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, there's a question about um, pediatric settings. Do we have, see any variations in these approaches to process improvement in pediatric settings? Well, that's what's so great about this, this more quality improvement tools in general is that the, they can be applied to anything. Uh, so, you know, the setting sometimes is important to give students context about how those, um, how the, their work would go and to give them examples about doing work in that area. But the tools, the, the problem solving approach that students learn can be applied to any setting, including pediatric setting. Great. And I got another question about settings and, and disciplines. Um, going back to the interprofessional, maybe Candace could answer this one. Are there any cases appropriate for counseling and social work? I heard social work mentioned. Yeah, definitely social work is in there. Uh, in a couple, many of the cases, actually, we used our social work component because they touch so many aspects of the healthcare environment. So yes, to answer your question, yes, they are in there. The cases. I, I love the one about the discharge planning where one what the person manager was res responsible for the discharge planning at one hospital was a nurse trained and another was social work trained and they had a conflict around sort of what was important to attract in terms of discharge reasons for readmissions and uh, that really underscores the values of counseling and social work as compared to other types of uh, professions so that may work for social work for sure yeah you're right and counseling, do, do, is there anything that addresses that or do you think it could be applied there? I'm not sure counseling specifically in terms of its relationship to, to clients, um, but the, the power of learning about quality improvement can apply to any profession, certainly, uh, especially around understanding how to measure quality and how to identify the gaps between where you are and where you want to be and create interventions to fix that. So in management or an application of systems thinking, yes, in one-on-one -on -one relationships with clients, probably not. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple questions that go, oh, well, a couple, few more questions. Um, they're slightly different, sorry, I thought they were related. Um, one on equity and inclusion, it's such a relevant topic. Do you have cases that address that from a quality perspective? Hmm. I can't think of one that we we should have. I, I think for the next edition, David. Zach, um, what? I was thinking about. I saw the question. I was thinking about the one about discharge phone calls in Espanol. Oh yes, of course. Uh, that one. Um, when I saw the question, that one came up to mind, and and that one is 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 one of those cases where, you know, it was an easy fix once you figure out that we were pretty much living out an entire piece of the population that did not speak Spanish, did not speak English, I mean, and they were Spanish speaking and they were, um, they were the reason why certain metrics in the, in the organization, in the hospital were really going, going south. So I think, um, I think we, do have, we do have an opportunity there with that case. Uh, that was definitely an inclusion case. 
You're exactly right. Good job. And that's sort of the voice of the customer issue. Yes. Nice. Great. Um, and I have another one um, about pediatrics here um, at a uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Culture is an important component of our QI journey. Um, can you speak to how this factor culture is touched on in this textbook? I'm going to defer to Eddie on this one and let him talk about chapter four. <laughs> yes, because um, th that's a dangerous one for 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 let me being here because I can get on my soapbox for a long time. But when we were putting this thing together, I think one of the the my I guess my flag was all around what we're trying to do here is is definitely build build culture and build the mindset. And we go really in depth about this in chapter four how quality improvement journey it's really that it's a journey and it's a complete mind mind uh set shift uh so we we really go deep into that in the chapter but we really were weaving that into every case and and, and that's one of those things that the three of us were always collaborating in, in all in all the cases and, and and zach deferred this question to me because he knows how passionate i am about this um it is front and center it is core to every one of our cases that this is a culture shifting uh journey it is a completely mind, mindset that you have to uh, adopt and one of the, the main things when we're thinking about students and early in their journey uh, of quality and healthcare administration, I've, I've said, you know, if we can get these people out there with this kind of mindset already, we'll be in a much better position because a lot of what we struggle with in the, in the real world as process improvement and quality improvement practitioners is getting people adjusted to that mindset. So it really, I'm going to get off my soapbox, but it really is really core to all the cases that, we, that we've that we developed. Absolutely. And I'd say that, you know, we really focus around that just culture and that shared mental model. So that's what you'll find threaded, as Eddie said, throughout the entire text. Um, and it'll help you absolutely infuse culture and what's associated with culture when it comes to change and, and process. And truly, it's about the people, right? So that, that has a lot to do with it. So thanks for asking that. Great. And there's another question about the podcasts. Um, we should go back to that and how to access the podcasts, um, which Zach, do you want to answer? Or do you want me to go into that as well? Oh, I love it because how Springer set it up. I'm really proud of you guys, how you did it. So you have QR code, allow the students to scan and it'll take them right to those. So I do it on my phone to listen to the podcast. You can download them onto your phone and do it when you're driving or while you're jogging or whatever. So that's a great way to do it. And then also you can go to their website and download them there or, or listen to them that way. Yes. And there are um, links within the chapters um, with the audio icon that will um, flag that there's a podcast related to that chapter content and case content. So there's several access points um, in the front matter of the book with the print version. Um, through links through the ebook and online versions. Um, you do get digital access with purchase of the print. Um, so any student that goes that route um, will be able to get the digital podcast through that, you know, QR code or um, through ebook access with the print version. They can also use the links to get to the podcasts. I think that's all the questions I have so far. If there are any Last questions that people want to send our way through the Q&A feature. Um, David, mm -hmm. there's one in the chat. Uh, someone type one in the chat box. Do you see that one? I don't. Hold on one second. Yes. Are there case studies that can support business case development? I'm looking for something that helps students work through the steps of creating a formal business case for quality improvement initiatives and quantifying the cost of poor quality. Can you speak to that, Zach? Or Eddie? That's a tough question. Well, um, I think we talked about the business case. Yes, of course, there's some around, even around building a bed uh, replacement process using a business case approach to having the right beds in a hospital and how bringing you know, people together to really build that strategy because what's the cost of poor quality of a poor bed? So that was one of them, as well as I believe we infused a little bit of this with the interventional radiology suite 
Yes. Um, and I was going, I was going to add, um, you know, even though, and, and that's one other thing that we always say, you know, cost, monetary cost should not, should not be the, the, the main purpose or anything, but the cost of poor quality goes beyond money. Uh, however, like if you look at another case, the ophthalmology uh, who could not see uh, quote unquote the waste, that's another case in which the, there were some large losses being um, incurred by, by the facility. And because of the fact that that mindset was not there and that people could really not see the waste that was right in front of them. And, and this one is all about inclusive uh, problem solving, including the team, because the team really had the ideas in the case. And it, as it is, it happens a lot in our, in our daily practice. So this one really built into that. What I was going to say is there's not a particular case that shows you how to develop that business case. But I think a lot of the, the way that these cases are being built and how the A3 develops throughout the course of that, of that, the journey of that particular case, it, it is teaching the students that the opportunity to do the, the business, develop the business case for each of these, um, each of these cases. So I think uh, there is definitely a, a use for that. Some cases may um, allow themselves better than others, but definitely there is a, there is an opportunity to use these cases for teaching that, that skill. Another one is the fulfillment affair, which is the case regarding an insurance company that needs that has high cost claims and needs to identify what the reason, the root cause of those high cost claims and create interventions to fix that and whether those interventions will actually be more costly than the, the high cost claims themselves. So Eddie's yes. right. I mean, they, they all provide, many of them provide extensive data and that data oftentimes what you need to do the analysis to create your business case. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you, Zach, Eddie, Candice on those. Um, we have another um, question um, about um, in case studies where improvements were achieved and sustained, are there any learnings that would help an improvement team to better understand how to spread those improvements to other departments or areas of the facility. That's pretty loaded, um, Zach. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I think I'll start um, and then I'll let you um, chime in, Zach or, or Candace. I think the, the A3, every A3 culminates with a lessons learned uh, box. And in those lessons learned, we've added in the solutions, we've added some opportunities there of how the, the case could have gone better, how we would have needed to involve other people. Now, you know, in the actual practice of you teaching these cases, you would not have a lot of opportunity to see those improvements sustained. But the, the lessons learned uh, piece, I think, a lot of, in, in a lot of the cases talks about what to do next to ensure that these um, uh, gains are sustained. And, uh, and we definitely talk a lot about that in a lot of the, in a lot of the cases and how to really, again, goes, goes back to that mindset and that culture of problem solving, what things do you need to put in place to make sure that those step, those uh, gains are sustained and if needed, how can they be spread throughout the, the facility? And so, David, that's a that was a good question. And so, I'll I'm looking at the table of contents now, just to refresh my memory around the question of how do you take quality improvement gains in one area and and bring it to another. I'm looking at at least three cases here that I think that apply to that from the a summer internship journal, which looks at patient flow in one department where you think the quality problem is, but it actually is others, and the analysis reveals itself to that be that way. The ophthalmologist who could not see had to convince one de uh, financial department and a clinical department to get behind the changes. Um, emergency department heroes had to, to get the team behind how to do a quality improvement process. And that was then, you know, shared with the team, like, look, we can't always be heroes. We have to, you know, share this with this methodology with other people. Uh, so there are many of those cases that I think that, that meet that need, if I'm understanding the question. I think the, the home care one, the patient experience in home care 
uh, also started the improvements in because this was a huge home care agency and they have like a north and a south region and they started the improvements in one region and it started where these regions were in siloed like that never happens in healthcare right so um, that was a joke so the <laughs> the the, they started as two completely separate regions, each working on their improvements. But then, as the case develops, they, you know, one starts learning from another, and, and we, they, they end up learning on how to spread that over. So I think there's a, a couple of cases that touch on on those. There's one about how to get physicians engaged in the quality improvement process, and their resistance, and the the approaches you might need to take for a physician to really engage in patient-centered medical homes. So I think that, I think we've got yeah. depending on how you you know approach that idea of you know expanding the scope of quality improvement from one department to another that there are plenty of cases that could apply to that idea. Terrific! Thank you guys for sharing those tidbits from the table of contents and cases. <laughs> it's fun to go back and look at the cases. You know, so it's been published and we're teaching from them, but it's fun to to look at these. Great. I don't see any further questions at this time. So why don't we um, go to the next slide, Zach? Um, so again, uh, thank you everyone for, you know, your thoughtful questions and, you know, helping the authors, you know, go through some aspects of the textbook um, that I think are innovative and practical and um, some great resources to go along with the textbook itself. This is all the time we have for today, but, you know, thanks for joining and hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, please visit us at www.springerpub.com slash Pruitt, uh, that's P-R-U-I-T-T, -T, for more information, including information on how to review the book, uh, sample cases, uh, the instructor's materials, and the podcast. Um, also, feel free to send us questions or comments through email, um, which uh, is at the next slide, I believe, to uh, Zach. Um, thanks so much again. Uh, and, you know, in this you know, really, you know, struggle, you know, struggle of a year, please continue to stay safe and, and well during this pandemic. Um, and those of you in the healthcare setting, especially, um, we thank you for, um, you know, combating uh, this, you know, disease spreading around uh, the communities and, and around the country. Um, and so thanks to all the healthcare workers on the front lines and those supporting them. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking time during another hectic week with um, an election and different things going on. So um, thanks so much again. And we'll post this webinar um, when uh, we're done um, in a few days. So great to have you guys participate. And thanks again to Zach, Candace, and Eddie. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.